our weekly FIT at Kulokin. Uh, Kulokin was, is, has been revived the idea of uh, bringing in interdisciplinary uh, topics by various uh, well, experts and scholars on the subject so that uh, uh, sort of a meeting ground can be created where you know, uh, various issues dealing with the Himalayan region right, can come together and entire sort of discourse be uh, formed. Uh, I would like to invite uh, my colleague uh, Adwitya to introduce this call. Adwitya. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, on behalf of uh, the director and uh, faculty members from the Center of Human Studies, I would like to welcome everyone today for this Friday uh, lecture and especially the speaker. Uh, the speaker, Anikhet Kapadakar Chetri, completed his uh, PhD uh, thesis from Delhi University under the supervision of Professor Asima Alavi. His thesis was titled Exploring the Dynamics of the Frontier Society in Bengal, Understanding the Processes Through Mangal Kavya Literature. His research interest lies in investigating the literary traditions across pre colonial India. I have taught at several uh, noted colleges across Delhi. He is currently working as an assistant professor in the Department of History in the College. So I will take this opportunity to uh, request uh, uh, Dr. Rajat to please come and uh, get a little bit Okay, oh, sorry. Before that, uh, I request our sir, uh, Rajat, sir, to kindly uh, welcome uh, Dr. Chetri for the Friday talk. Um, before we waste any time, I'd like to request Dr. Chetri to thank you for uh, making this lecture. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. I would first like to thank the Center for Himalayan Studies for providing me an opportunity to come out here and speak upon something. So, uh, I would first like to apologize well in advance. I, myself, do not work in Himalayan region. Uh, my entire career so far has focused primarily on looking at the Mughals and the process of the expansion, primarily in Bengal. Now, the idea for this paper, or the credit for this paper, goes to a friend of mine, her name is Anukta Gairola. She started researching on the Kumau Garhwal regions. However, for certain reasons, she was not able to complete this particular paper. And that is when I stepped in with my man management uh, talent and made sure that her paper gets a new audience. So we worked on this together. And the whole idea is, as you can see, to explore the Mughal relations with the Garhwal state. Now, uh, to begin with, the Mughal state or the Mughal Empire, as we all know, was one of the most important imperial dynasties, traditions to have ruled over the subcontinent. Now, whenever we talk of Mughal Indian history, the entire focus of historians, right from Jadnav Sarkar to Irfan Nabi, Muzaffar Alam, and likewise, have been to explore the political dynamics, which is primarily centered around Delhi. Agra, Fatehpur Sikri, Lahore. Recently we have works which shift the focus a bit from the center to what they call the peripheries. Alright, so we have works on Bengal, works on the Deccan. These are not, mind you, very mainstream works. Uh, so all those who work on Bengal history are looking like a frown on their faces. If you work with Bengali sources, not fully Persianized. That is the condition of Mughal Indian understanding when it comes to peripheries. Unfortunately, with the Himalayan region, the neglect is far greater. When we began working on this paper, coincidentally we found that there has been no noted work on the central Himalayan region, or let's say the entire Himalayan region, to examine the way this region interacted with the Mughal state. A kingdom, a dynasty, an empire which ruled across the subcontinent for around 250 years, it is impossible that they would have no connections whatsoever with the Himalayan region. But there is a paucity of works on this. So ours is a brief attempt to try and alter the historical perspective 
and try and shift the focus away from Delhi to onto what we call the peripheries of the empire and here we introduce the Himalayan region as well. This current paper primarily looks at the Garhwal kingdom. Now as you all must be well aware better than me perhaps that Garhwal and Kumau both fall in the what we call the central Himalayan belt. Now to understand the Mughal dynamics with the Garhwal region it is important first to take a look at Mughal state formation itself. Now whenever we take the idea of Mughal state formation, if we look at the uh, traditional school of history of historians who believe in the Mughal empire being a very centralized kind of a structure, behemoth that ruled across the subcontinent, the idea is very very easy to take in. The empire was a centralized state which conquered, annexed all of the regions and established its authority. But if you look at each and every region, you will find that the dynamics is far more complicated. State building or the process of what we call empire formation had more shades than simply conquering a region and annexing its ruling dynasties or ruling groups. Uh, and that is exactly where the narrative gets a lot more interesting to process as we will hopefully be able to see in the course of our discussion with the Garhwal Raj. Now where does our study for Mughal relations with Garhwal begin? As you know, uh, the Mughal Empire or its consolidation happened under Akbar, who ruled from 1556 to 1605. That's a good 49 years that we're talking about. So then we should first start looking there to see what the texts, what the inscriptions say about their relations with the Himalayan region. Now, surprisingly, if we go to Abul Fazl and his famous work, Akbar Nama, three volumes, Ayn Akbari, you will find that there is a solitary reference to the Himalayan region that we are talking about, the central Himalayan belt. There is a solitary reference to Kumau, not Garhwal. Kumau is considered to be a part of the Delhi Suba. Uh, as you know, in Akbar's period, the entire empire was divided into Subas. By his time, it was 12 Subas, which was late into 16 and then 21, by the modern day comes from the picture. Of these 12 Subas, Delhi was obviously one of the most important Subas, and Kumau was mentioned as a part of the Delhi Suba. There is no reference to Garhwal. Now, does this mean that Garhwal was not part of the Mughal imaginings? That's not possible. Because, understand, if you look at the iconographic descriptions of the Mughal Empire, of their very titles, Nuruddin Jahangir, Shah Jahan, the conqueror of the world, the holder of the global earth. If you see their paintings where you find Jahangir standing on top of a globe, these are not rulers who think about small binary distinctions that this is my rule. For them, the empire is, quoting Joss Gomans, the empire is without limits. There is no limits to the empire, the empire will expand. So it's very dichotomous that such an expanding empire that the Mughals wanted to create will have no reference whatsoever to the Garhwal kingdom. But that is apparently what is happening. Or maybe the problem happens because we are focusing too much on Persian sources. What if for one moment we shift our attention from Persian sources to sources in other languages, vernaculars for example, then what happens to the picture? Then we will find that the picture gets a lot more complex. It's no longer a unilinear narrative of an empire trying to force its way through different regions. Uh, so let us start our story of the Garhwal Empire a bit before the Mughals. Now, the rulers of the Garhwal Raj were Parmas. These are Rajputs. All right. Uh, some say that they are linked to the Chauhans by matrimonial links. However, the uh, Parma rulers of Garhwal they trace their descent to a particular individual called Kanakpal. Now, this gentleman came from different places according to different historians. So if you look at someone like H.K. Rathuri, who worked a lot on Garhwal Gaitihas, wrote brilliant texts on Garhwali history. All right, so according to Rathuri and his fellow scholar Patiram, they argue that Kanakpal came from Central India, a place that they call Dharnagiri, which is in Malwa. And it is believed that uh, Kanakpal came here for pilgrimage purposes because this region of Kumau geographically has what we have as the Kedarnath region. So very, very spiritually important to a traditional Hindu religious discourse. 
So that idea can be bought that a certain gentleman called Kanakpal made a movement from Tharnagiri onto this region. And surprise, surprise, out here he gets to meet the daughter of a ruling chief and they get married and the daughter or, or the daughter's father after his death passes his kingdom onto his son-in-law. So far the story is pretty fine. Now, according to Rahul Sankirtan, who did a lot of work on this region as well, Rahul Sankirtan feels that this kind of a uh, origin myth is very natural to find in the central Himalayan region in Puma Garwal, where they trace the descent of the king from outside the region. The reason that Rahul Sankirtan gives is for legitimization, because you need to find a descent to northern India, to Chandra Vanshi, Surya Vanshi, solar lineages. And Rahul Sankirtan is of the belief that actually the gentleman Tanakpal was from Kumau itself. He believes that he was a a descendant of an older dynasty called the Katyuri dynasty. All right, so there is a slight debate about where Kanakpal came from. But what is known for sure in all these things is Kanakpal is considered to be the first person who actually began what we call the Parma Raj in Karwal. Now, from Kanakpal onwards, the historiography or hagiography in certain cases becomes very muddling. Because we come across different names, it vary. So we will not go into each and every name because that will just be a political trajectory of sorts. Uh, the individuals about whom we have some important references is, or about whom we shall look into out okay, here because we are primarily trying to focus ourselves on the Mughal Indian region, is a particular gentleman who comes from the same uh, lineage. All right, And uh, his name is Sahaj Pal. Now, why am I giving Sahaj Pal's name? Anyone familiar with Garwali history might say there are other rulers before him as well. Because Sahaj Pal is dated to 1548. Alright, whereas if you go to a traditional understanding, the Garwal dynasty or the uh, uh, Kanak Pal's dynasty began in 888 C. So I am giving a huge 700 years jump. Why him only? There are two reasons for taking up Sahaj Pal. First, because he is the only gentleman about whom we have what we call solid, hard historical evidence. By hard historical evidence, we are talking about inscriptions. So there is an inscription found at the Chamuri village. This is a small village in the north of Nadira Dehradun. There is a temple where we have an inscription which talks or which refers to Sahaj Pal and his date is 1548. Now, 1548 is very interesting because this is exactly the time when Humayun is making a return. He had been exiled, alright. Sher Shah had thrown him out, alright. So, he is looking for a way back. So, we are focusing on him because he is contemporaneous to what we call the resurgence of the Mughal Empire. And uh, Sahaj Pal ruled for around 27 years, so around the 1570s. So, he should be contemporary to Akbar. Now, Unfortunately, though he was contemporary to Akbar, the sources are very silent about any kind of dealings between him and the Mughals. And by sources out here, I am only am talking about Persian sources. We unfortunately do not have any textual or literary sources for Sahaj Pal's period. Uh, what is interesting, however, is now there is this uh, literary scribe whose name is Mullah Ram. Now, Mullah Ram is important because he belonged to the Garhwal court. He was the court poet of the Garhwals in the later period, say 17th century. So he is credited to have written a history of the uh, rulers of Garhwal, right from uh, Sahaj Pal onwards. Now he mentions that Sahaj Pal's son, Sahaj Pal's son was called Bal Bhadra, Bal Bhadra Pal. Now Mola in his account is a very interesting description which is very important for us. Now, Bal Bhadra was supposed to have been given the title of Shah. Bal Bhadra Shah. Now, here we have a semantic change. From a Pal, we become a Shah. All right? And subsequently, all rulers of the Parma dynasty are known as Shahs. Prithvi Pati Shah, Mahi Pati Shah, etc. etc. Now, Shah, if you see, is a very Persianized idiom. So, we are talking suddenly a shift from being Pals to being Shahs. And what could be the reason for it? And Mularam gives a very fascinating reason. He says, this young gentleman once met Akbar. 
And this is the first time, therefore, we have a reference between the Mughals and the mighty Garhwal state. But again, not in a Persian source. All right. And apparently, uh, what happened was Akbar was out hunting, all right, and uh, a lion attacked Akbar, which is kind of dubious because this region is not known for lions. So hunting lions, you see, if you read the article, Mughals for hunting lions, you'll find that lions are found primarily in uh, Ajmer and other regions, Malwa regions. So it's a little far-fetched for finding lions, but Mughals did for hunting. It could be a tiger, it could be a bear. But Modaram's account is interesting because Modaram very critically states that Balbhadra apparently protected Akbar from the lion or any animal which you can put for historicans is. And because of his bravery, because he protected Akbar's life, he was given a tough shah. And that's why he began to use a little Balbhadra shah in all his future correspondences. So all inscriptions of Balbhadra is found with the epithet shah or Balbhadra shah. So here we have a very, uh, let's say the first beginnings of what we can call a sort of interaction between the Mughals, the mighty Mughals and the, this far away stretched in a small little zone, uh, Himalayan kingdom. And here in fact we find that rather than Akbar coming with all his divine light as a wolf first would like us to believe, the near perfect man, the insane Kamil, the Farah Izadi, who is actually the liberator of all mankind, the pinnacle of human achievement, is actually being protected and saved by a gentleman. Now, here you might say it's possible this was a, a hyperbole, this is an exaggeration. But keeping our minds open to these possibilities, we do find that non Persian sources or sources which are not exactly borrowing from the center are actually making a reference to Mughal interaction here. However, this is still too much to say that Mughal state building began here. Because this is a literary incident which Modaram very critically spurs in his narrative on Bhagavad Gita. So let us for one example go by what traditional historians say and let us believe that Modaram's source is a story. End of it. Nothing happened during Akbar and Muntai. If we come to real literary references of interactions between the Parma rulers, and the Mughal state, then we have to go a few years ahead in time. We have to go to Jahangir's period. And here suddenly we find that we are no longer depending upon a Molaram or an alternative non quote based source. In fact, the great emperor, His Majesty Jahangir, in his autobiography called Tuzuke Jahangiri, for the first time now actually makes reference to a Garwari ruler. The ruler that he talks about is Shyam Shah, who he refers to the Zamindar of Garhwal. Now this is very interesting because the Mughals referred to everyone as Zamindars. Even Rana Pratap was a Zamindar, Shivaji was a Zamindar. So that's very understanding. Any local rulers would be Zamindars because the paramount ruler is the Mughal emperor. He is a Shahanshah, a Badshah. Alright, that is interesting. Now, so according to the Tuzuke Jahangiri, it was with Shyam Shah, whom we now know for sure was the name of Balbhadra Shah's son. Alright. Sham Shah is the first person about whom we have reference in a Persian source in the Jahangir Nama of actually having interacted with Jahangir. What sort of interaction was this? Now this was no longer the kind of interaction that Moraram talks about which is non-spatial, non-temporal. You don't know when it happened, where it happened, whether it's even true or not. This is a reference of a particular incident where Jahangir is said to have given one horse and one elephant to the Zamindar. The first question then comes from being marginalized in the pages of Mughal history, why would suddenly Jahangir make gifts or give something like a horse and elephant to a nondescript Shyam Shah? And here lies the crux. Now, you have to realize that the region of Garhwal and Guma, or for our purpose, let's take Garhwal out here, may not have been economically very lucrative, but they had two things out here which was very important. One was the forests. The forest resources across the Thun Valley, which provided timber, elephants, honey, lap, all of which are very economically important substances. In fact, the primary wealth of the Garhwal Raj came from forest products because their agrarian region was very limited. We'll focus on that later. So, the entire fertile agrarian region was around the Dehra Thun Valley. Alright, why it's called Dehra will come to that later. It's an interesting story out there as well. So, 
obviously there were forest resources to tap into and there was the very important pilgrimage centers now for a ruler like jahangir who wants to proclaim himself as the king of the world understand he is the same person who started patronizing the uh, jagannath cult in odisha all right in fact from jahangir's period onwards we will find references that the mughal subedar in odisha used to be present at the annual rath yatra he would sit symbolizing the emperor's uh, presence out there he, jahangir may not have been as popular a ruler as akbar is for historians but he is a very important person in the sense that he had the dimensions of empire building in that now unlike a lot of historians who believe that empire building was a unilinear narrative my argument or our argument in this case is empire building has many what we call interactions with local corporate social forces so empire building is not just annexing a place or having a conflict of sorts it rests on two things cooperation and conflict both are important now unfortunately historians often focus on the conflict part and forget the cooperation part what they forget is that the mughals in fact focused a lot on cooperation and collaboration with local stakeholders to extend their political authority this is exactly how the mughal political frontier was expanding going to bengal don't have to go very far away going to bengal the entire debate about the bara bhuyans pratapaditya in eastern bengal bharti jahangir sent his governor islam shah with explicit instructions that if pratapaditya decides to cooperate with you give him gifts and make him happy so you have to understand that in the mughal world view fighting or entering into a direct conflict was very uneconomical you waste a lot of resources you waste a lot of mobile mobile resources in fighting a war if you can co-opt a territory into accepting your authority without resorting to direct warfare it is much more beneficial for the economics of the empire and this is exactly where cooperation becomes important and that is why this solitary incident between uh, jahangir and sham shah is very crucial because this marks the forays of the mughal state where they now want to enter into a sort of alliance building with these rulers and part of alliance building will always be providing patronage you have to provide patronage to your clients you have to establish what we call a client patron relationship with these groups you have to make them believe that you have materially more incentives to offer than anyone else and that's how you co-opt them into your sphere of influence this was exactly a case of jahangir trying to build a aura about the mughal empire around sham shah this is exactly what he did with mewar remember akbar failed to control mewar numerous wars were fought with ranar pratap nothing happened zero zilch still me it was only jahangir who was able to bring rana amar singh and his son rana karan singh into the mughal fold and what was the method used it was simple in in his tuzuki jahangir he mentions let karan shah come let him come to agra we will show him the delights of the mughal empire so this was a way of seducing the mind of these local zamindars they were going to be bedazzled with what they had never seen before and that's what happens by the time rana karan singh comes back to mewar he is more mughal than the mughals himself all right you will find in all his paintings portrait with the choba with all his headgear he has persian literary around him so in certain manner this way of state building was successful jahangir had done that in the war he had brought to end a decades long conflict with a very important uh, rajput principality so bits of it were being used out here unfortunately for jahangir district jahangir tried his best to woo, woo the decadent sham shah zamindar of uh, garhwal to enter into sort of alliance but it could never materialize how do we know it did not materialize we know that if you look at shah jahan jahangir did this thing so do we not find anything more than this but it's pretty sure this was done with a certain perspective that okay i'm trying to uh, bind them to me through a client patron network where i will be accepted as the super power or the paramount uh, authority and they would accept uh, their subordinate status to me that was what must have gone in jahangir's head and remember a lot of the mughal politics happened in their heads all right the mughals thought they were the paramount empire in the world 
So in their paintings, Shahab Bas, the tiny figure who is like three feet in height compared to the great Jahangir. So that must have been his idea regarding Shyam Shah. And it's no wonder the Mughals had been able to do this successfully with other smaller principalities. But things backfired. Now we know this from Shah Jahan's period. Now in Shah Jahan's period, we have a lot of sources. Here we have the paucity of sources. Again, the problem is none of them are conventional Persian sources. So we have the foreign travelers, Nikola Manucci, in Historia de Mughal. He talks about a particular interesting episode. All right, and uh, to put it chronologically, Shyam Shah was followed by his son, who died very soon, and hence his grandson had to be put on throne. His grandson's name is Prithvi Pati Shah. This is the time around 1631 when Shah Jahan is the ruler. Prithvi Pati Shah was a minor. So he could not handle ruling. So his mother was the regent. His mother's name was Rani Karnavati. Now this is interesting because in Nikola Manucci's work, we have the reference to a military being sent by Shah Jahan into Dehradun or the region around Karinite Dehradun. Now understand this is a sudden change that is happening from suddenly showering gifts okay i'm giving you horses and elephants suddenly i'm sending troops into your region that doesn't make sense that's not real politics but what led to this nikola monoji doesn't mention the causes to it nikola monoji says that shah Khan sent an army that army was able to enter up till then unfortunately uh, the rains set in so the mughal supply lines were stretched and uh, the Garwal army, though not extremely important at this point of time, they were successfully able to follow guerrilla tactics of warfare, cut off supply reinforcements, surround the Mughal forces, and the Mughals suffered a defeat. That's what Manuji tells us. So the Mughals went to Garwal, lost, came back. What makes it more interesting is another source, Marsimi Umra. This is written by one of the nobles of the Mughal court late 17th century. He in fact goes a little beyond this and he refers to someone called the Nak Kati Rani. Alright, now who is Nak Kati Rani? According to local legend, Rani Karnavati is known as the Nak Kati Rani. Why? So, again, just extending from where Manuji stopped, the Mughals had lost, they surrendered, and they want a safe passage back. So, in Marcel Lumra, it was the regent, Rani Karnavati, who says to Najabat Khan, who is the Mughal commander in chief at this point of time, that I will let you go, no problems whatsoever, provided all your soldiers cut their noses and offer it to me as a mark of Mughal humiliation. Now, here are the great Mughals who were dreaming about uh, world conquering. All right, this is Jahangir and Shah Jahan. Guess their names. They don't focus on Delhi Agra. Delhi Jahan is here. Shah Jahan. Here, the great Shah Jahan's mighty army is being forced to cut their noses. And cutting of noses or cutting of any part in your body, as you know, in traditional Hindu iconography, mythology, is a sign of mutilation. You're mutilating the authority associated with it. That is why we find initially when temples were being destroyed or when mosques were being built on top of desolate temples, you will find the Islamic rulers always mutilated the anthropomorphic figures. So if you go to Qutub Minar, you will find the statues are there, but their noses are cut. Years are mutilated. So something of this sort is happening. And well, popular folklore goes that the Mughals are forced to do it. So here is again, not only is uh, uh, Marsil, not only is it reinforcing what Manuji said, it in fact adds another chapter to Mughal humiliation that took place under Shah Jahan. Alright. Question is why would the Mughals suddenly decide to attack Garwal? Now, out here, unfortunately, we have to once again go back to Mr. Molaram, who always provides his answers. Molaram says that Shah Jahan had sent a khilat. A khilat is a rope which the emperors used to send to their subordinates as a gesture of their overwhelming paramountcy. So, apparently, a rope was sent to the young Prithipati Shah, and what was implicit in this rope was. By accepting this killer, he also accepts Mughal authority. Now, according to Mullah Ram, the killer was sent back, and the messenger or the messengers replied that no, we will not accept your authority. And that is exactly why Shah Jahan was forced to send in his forces, because that would be an utter humiliation for the Mughal army or the Mughal 
uh, imperial authority to be undermined in this particular manner. So if you just put the sources together, a lot of historians' work is also reconstruction, as postmodernism would state, that the facts are out there, you need to weave them together. You need to enthrop it, you need to find a coherent narrative to build around it. So we have three sources, Master Numra, you have Nikola Munoci, and you have Muraram's crucial account. What they definitely say is the Shah Jahan's army lost. So if three sources are saying the same thing, basic methodology that you follow in research says this must be correct, or some part of it must be true. So Mughal army sent, they lost, they came back. Most probably humiliated and returned as well. Why? And it doesn't seem too difficult to believe that the reason behind this was because Prithvi Pati Shah, who was a minor at that time, refused to accept Shah Jahan's killer. Understand, Shah Jahan must have thought that his father, by providing a horse and an elephant, must have already established their paramount civil Garwal. So when this mirage or this illusion was shattered, he had to respond. He had no other way. Understand, whenever Mughal imperial authority has been challenged, the Mughals have resorted to warfare. Be it in the case of Aurangzeb, be it in the case of Shah Jahan, it's a very basic imperial tendency. You accept authority, you are fine with it, you do not accept it, well, come, let's have a war. Unfortunately, in Shah Jahan's period, the war did not quite end in the way Shah Jahan wanted to. And for the next 20 years, we did not find any Mughal forces being sent to the region. So they also were aware that the Himalayan region is not exactly like Delhi, Lahore, Agra, which is basically plains where you enter in and fight. This, the geographical terrain of central Himalayan, well, it's a rocky, rough terrain. The only plain that you get is around Dehradun, most are forests. So the Mughal, first of all, the Mughal cavalry was ineffective. You cannot move up horses along slopes. First thing. Secondly, uh, they couldn't bring their big cannons along. So they had to primarily rely on matchlock muskets, uh, what we call Tufang, that is pistols, and maybe short cannons. And the other disadvantage they had is that they were not aware of the geography. And the basic military strategy that was being followed by the uh, Garwal army was very simple. Let them enter, then encircle them, cut off their supply lines. Garhwal is too far from Delhi or Lahore or Agra anyway to be constantly be replenished through supplies. So you have to realize that for any Delhi-based empire to capture the Himalayas or the Himalayan region, be it the central Himalayan region, the Shivalik region, it's not always possible through force. And that is exactly why we need to focus more on alternative methods of state building, which does not just rely on warfare, which relies on more covert means, which relies on cooperation, manipulation, uh, pressurizing the operator, which up till Shah Jahan had failed. 